Hey everyone, it is December 12, 2012. I'm Rene Ritchie, and right now we're going to be talking about where the new Mac Pro is, whether sensors are the future of Apple, alternative keyboards for iOS, and what's with all the picture messaging apps. This is the iMore Show. Joining me as always, we have the managing editor of imore.com and birthday boy, Peter Cohen. How are you, Peter? I am fine, thank you. So you're finally legal. Indeed. In all 50 states the... and some US uh, territories as well. You can find out what this Heineken stuff is that Dalrymple keeps talking about. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> also joining me, the lovely, and I, I don't even think she's anywhere near legal yet, Ali Kazmu, how are you? Cold. Cold? In your heart or in your environment? Maybe both. It's like zero degrees here. It's terrible. Zero degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit. Isn't it both? Same for both? No, no minus 30, 32 is zero. Yeah, 30, yeah. yeah. And joining us from the other side of the continent. So Peter is in Boston. Allie is in this place. And I want to get this on the record. Allie lives in Long Beach, but not Long Beach, California. She lives in Long Beach, which is in, um, what's the city again, Allie? Is it Missouri City or something? Michigan City. In Michigan City, but not Michigan, whatever state Michigan is in. I think Michigan is a state. Uh, so she's in Long Beach, Michigan, Indiana, which is right next to Chicago. Yes. That makes no sense. That's Geography. like Richard. That's like Richard being in Berlin, France, province, England, right next to Estonia. Yeah, and via Scotland or something. It's <laughs> I, I don't I, I don't get it. I live in a continent that's smaller than your crazy country. <laughs> Coming to us from that continent, from that small island, from the British Isles, from uh, some place which I'm going to pretend is London because it's too crazy for me to follow. Richard Devine, how are you, Richard? Uh, very well, Renee. Hello, everybody. I am so geographically confused, Peter. <laughs> yeah, F in geography. How does that work? So and I want to start off by complaining. Policy. I want to start off by complaining about Google Hangouts. We're a few minutes uh, late today because I went to start the Google Hangout as usual. We use Google Hangouts to record the video for the show, and they changed the entire interface again. At one point, you know, Hangouts were just a click away from the Google main the main Google Plus page, then they moved them to the sidebar, Hangouts on Air became a separate thing. Now I went to start it, and it gave me an event page, start an event that then contained a Hangout that I could start now, which is not only needlessly confusing, but when we live in an era where web-based interfaces can change all the time, it is, it is incumbent upon you, Google, to make these things easy and not to switch around the interface to confuse people and cause them more stress and problems in their lives. That's all. That's all I'm going to rant about that. Anyway, I think I that's a reasonable rant. Thank you, Peter. I consider that a badge of honor coming from you. <laughs> I was traveling last week, so we could not have a show. So we're going to more than make up for it today. And the first thing I want to talk about, Peter, is where is my Mac Pro? Yeah, that's the sixty thousand dollar question. You know, um, we were promised a Mac Pro in December. We're still going to get it in December, but I think Apple's just trolling us, and they're going to wait until like the last day of, of December or something and release it then. Um, that's you know, it's 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 a it's a point of open speculation right now, and I've seen speculation um, on the web that suggests that we're going to get it sometime next week or, you know, whatever. Look, I don't think it's too likely that we're going to get it around right around Christmas because Apple pretty much shuts down yes. right around Christmas. So it's probably a safe bet um, that we're going to see it sometime in the next week or so because they did promise it in December. And we know that the Mac Pro has already been shipping in very limited quantity for a while because, uh, you know, Pixar has been using them for months. Apple internally um, has them. Apple internally has them. And one got sold in that... Uh, uh, that 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 auction for um, Red, the AIDS charity, um, that uh, Tony Fidel apparently bought. He's the uh, one of the the fathers of the iPod, of course, and the CEO of Nest, the smart thermostat company. Um, he was actually showing off uh, the Red Mac Pro, um, which uh, you and I both uh, lost after. Yes. Um, uh, to a friend of his uh, the other day who took his pictures and uploaded Mac it to Pro. Twitter. Yeah, $977,000 Mac Pro, paying just a little bit over street value uh, for the Mac Pro. But <laughs> hey, is a look, way for him to re ingratiate himself to Johnny, you know, just get back on good terms. 
get back on good terms with them, right? Yeah, no, seriously. Hey, look, it's nice that these Silicon Valley millionaires can throw around money like this. So, I I mean, this week was certainly a likely candidate. This week is almost over. Like you said, Apple shuts down pretty much over the holiday. I mean, retail absolutely doesn't, but Apple corporate does, and they're probably going to want to be involved. But if the iPad mini, Richard, if the iPad mini launch taught us anything, it's that I just, Peter and I just can't sleep until this thing is out. That is exactly what I said to Peter last night. Just don't go to sleep from now until January 1st. It could, it could happen anyway. You, you could be going out for a drink New Year's Eve, and who knows? Apple might divert you to the local Apple store. It, it's, it's not unheard of. It's still in December, so don't Allie, sleep if you want one. Ali, is this even a real problem, or is this just geeks trying to figure out how many threes of thousands of dollars they're going to spend before Christmas? Yeah, it's not a real problem. <laughs> Um, I don't, I don't know that I, the Retina iPad Mini launch was the weirdest thing I've ever seen Apple do with a launch. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with constraint, though. I don't think they made a big deal about it because there weren't a lot to go around. So I, I don't know. I, I think it could happen at any point. I think it's one of those products, though, that has, it's very niche. I don't think that you're gonna see them make a big deal about it like the iPhone. So again, like Richard said, you just better not sleep. So Peter, like you and I have been talking about which, in our dreams, if we had Fidel money, um, which Mac Pro we 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 lust after the most. And I'm leaning towards uh, with my Nehala Mac Pro. I got the first generation Nehala Mac Pro. I went for more cores slower, and I've kind of always regretted that. I got eight cores because 12 wasn't available then, but I think they're 2.2 or something really slow. Uh, this time I'm thinking to go for the minimum number of cores, four cores but go fast, get a mid-range video card, maybe upgrade the RAM and get maybe 512 worth of internal storage because I'm not sure um, one terabyte is really worth it yet. Yeah, you know, it's 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 really been an interesting question. And uh, uh, Marco Arment um, posted um, something, I think, to his blog last week about this, sort of comparing the uh, cost effectiveness, uh, suspected cost effectiveness, actually, because we don't really know bottom line, how these things are going to cost once they're outfitted. What I can tell you um, is that just based on the parts alone, like if you were to go out and source uh, a Fire Pro, uh, 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 you, like a dual uh, Fire Pro system and um, a, uh, a Xeon uh, a chip like the one that they're going to use, uh, in the new Mac Pro, you will sp be spending thousands and thousands of dollars really quickly. So if you say to yourself, oh, well, I want a 12-core system with the D700, um, which is the, the, the top-of-the-line video card option, my suspicion is that you're going to be spending pretty close to what a small car costs to outfit that thing. Um, I think that most people um, who are using this are going to be able to get away with a much uh, slower configuration. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to what you're going to be doing with it because the bottom line is the Mac Pro is a parallel processing powerhouse. <laughs> that's, that's not um, functionality that a lot of Mac users, like just general purpose Mac users Will it need. make Netflix faster on my home theater PC, Peter? Absolutely not. It won't do a damn thing about Netflix. Now, if, if you are Netflix and you are doing conversions of movies, then it will make a difference. You know, if you're a video editor, which of course, uh, I, I know that you and, and Ali and Richard will dabble with video. I'll do quite a bit of video. Um, it will make a difference in your workflow and it'll make a big difference to have more cores because the more, you know, when you're dealing with apps like Final Cut Pro or even like Handbrake, if you're doing a conversion from a DVD, um, those those apps are very well optimized uh, for multi-core processors. If you listen to the last episode of Vector where Don Melton told you how he encodes all his Blu-ray discs, you might want one of these. Right, exactly. It's those sort of things that are going to be really fast. But this 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 system isn't going to get you amazing frame rates in uh, in Portal 2. It's not going to get you um, you know faster downloads from the internet. So it's kind of a as as Ali said, it's it's a niche machine. Uh, it's a really cool niche machine, but it's um, it's it's not something that I think is 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 for everyone. But if you're doing serious content creation, if you're um, you know a graphic designer, a video editor, um, if you're doing science or research, and you've got apps that are optimized for OpenCL, the Mac Pro is going to be hellaciously fast for you. Richard, are you lusting in your heart after a new Mac Pro as well? 
no, I need a car. I can't afford to buy a Mac Pro. <laughs> <laughs> Mac Pro, car. Mac yeah, Pro, it, car. It, it, it's, and I mean, even like the base UK prices, it is kind of half of what I'm looking to spend on a car. So no chance. I'd, I'd never even get close to touching what it's going to, what this thing can do. A uh, uh, Retina MacBook Pro is more than, more than enough for me right now. Ali, what about you? Do you want two of them so you can strap them to your back like the Rocketeer? <laughs> that sounds like a really, really cool idea, but I don't think I could justify that. I bought a 13-inch Haswell MacBook Air for travel um, when those came out, and I just bought a 27-inch iMac at the beginning of the year. Um, I bought a spec'd out configuration with a solid state, and for what I do, I don't do it too much video for iMore, but I do enough of it to notice a difference, but I don't think I would ever do enough of it to justify a Mac Pro. So I, there will not be lineups. This is not going to be like an iPhone launch. This, Peter, in my guess, will just at some point uh, hear the internet screaming that they're available for order on Apple because the pages are already there. It just says coming December. Yeah, that's exactly right. What's going to happen is somebody in midnight in Sydney, Australia or something is going to uh, notice that they're suddenly available for sale and we'll get an email and post something right away about it. Um, that, that I suspect, is, is what's going to happen. Either that or our press release will go out at 8.32 on you know, a Monday or Tuesday afternoon, as it usually does from Apple when, when they uh, release a new product, and we'll get confirmation of it then. Uh, but as you said, Renee, this isn't something that people are going to be lining up overnight for. But those of us who you know, have a soft spot in our, our hearts for the Mac Pro, I'm, I'm working you know, on a, on a five-year-old one right now that I'm kind of stroking gently and just hoping that it continues to work for a while. Um, Syracuse uh, posted our, a picture of some bastard putting two of them out with the garbage, and I almost lost my mind. <laughs> oh God, that breaks my heart. You know, I see them come into the the store every so often too, um, and you know they're always like it's it's like looking at at like. You know, if if a computer came out of the Millennium Falcon, this is what it would look like. It's sort of carbon scored and, uh, you know, got scratches <laughs> all over it. And I wonder what the hell our clients are doing with these things. Blaster fire. Yeah. I so, guess uh, I actually, I, I guess the clients who use them uh, most frequently are the uh, marine biologists down at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and the marine biological laboratories, which aren't too far away from where I, uh, I work on the weekends. Peter, can you get the shark's tooth out of the grill? I mean, I didn't think it would stick like that. Exactly. So one of the other rumors is these 4K displays, and I think Richard saw them very briefly online, uh, the sharp version at least. Apple, I've heard the same rumors that everybody else has heard that Apple has been working on 4K displays. I haven't heard anything about how soon, if at all this year, they'll be available. But it makes a certain amount of sense because, you know, for Retina, they typically have pixel double things. But pixel doubling one of the current 27-inch displays resulted in a huge amount of pixels and that might be prohibitive in terms of yield and price points but if you go to 4k instead of really retina with the or you know at 2x with the 27 inch display it's really like 1.5x I, I think um, 4k is 2160 by uh, what is it 48 something it's 1920 double so that's 3840 um, resolution and from the distance that you sit at that size Richard I don't think most people would notice a difference but they still got marketing appeal and they're probably you, you know Theoretically, not like over three grand. Yeah, I mean, 4K is one of the buzzwords, I suppose, at the moment. And you mentioned the one that briefly went on sale over here and, and subsequently got pulled. So I don't think anybody probably even managed to get one. But even that, at that size was was thousands of pounds. And you know, couple that with a Mac Pro, and you really are looking at what I'm gonna, what I want to spend on a car. <laughs> so uh, they're they're still not cheap. But I mean, the I mean for me the I would I would always personally shy more towards getting a 4K TV rather than just a 4K monitor. I mean, I'm not in the, the business of, of video editing and stuff like that, so, so 4K is bound to be plenty for, for those creative types, but I would personally always look to try and get something I could like use as a TV as well rather than just hook up to my, uh, to my computer because they're expensive. Allie, you're, you're smiling there. Is that because you don't want a 4K iMac next year? <laughs> Not at all. My thing, I mean, for graphic designers and people that actually need it, I think there's a place for it. But at the end of the day, Richard brought up 4K TVs. It comes down to if you're watching recorded media, but at the end of the day, I don't know about by you guys, but here, no companies even broadcast, broadcast in 1080p yet. 
So for me, it's wasted. So people, you know, made a big deal about 1080p and LED and, I mean, Comcast and a lot of other broadcasters, none of those TV stations are even broadcasting at that yet. So for designers, sure. For mainstream, I don't really think there's a point. I think it's wasted money. So, well, I want to come back to what I said before about film filmmakers. Filmmakers are the ones who who need 4K. If you've mm -hmm. been to um, you know a, if you've been to a movie theater lately, chances are you've watched uh, a digital movie in 4K, and it'll say right up on the screen, Sony 4K Cinema, blah blah blah. Um, so you know a lot of movies these days are are being mastered in 4K. Um, it, it it makes sense. Um, in, in those cases, for those people to use 4K, but yeah, 4K doesn't really have any pr practical consumer applications right now. Just too damn many pixels, and the TV sets are way, way too expensive for most people yep. to bother with. You know, I mean, but the price, the price on 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 um, on high def TVs has come way down. You know, I'm seeing 50 inch TVs now for. Uh, you know, 600 bucks. You know, uh, all the time on the, on the deal pages that I watch. So I, you know, it, it's only a matter of time before the 4K stuff drops um, in price the a Mac little bit. Pro can drive three of them. Right. Whoa. Exactly. Yeah, and it's got HDMI 1.4, so it can drive <laughs> one of the big TVs too. I mean, look know. at LED. I not even I don't I don't go into stores that often like Best Buy, but I remember we just recently went into Best Buy and I saw like a 55 inch Samsung LED TV for seven hundred dollars. Like that that same TV three two years ago was four thousand dollars. But Ali, so. you you hit on the the real problem with this, which is that there's no 4K content available for it. Mm -hmm. When Sony rolled out its 4K TV earlier this year, it actually had to provide its own streaming box so people would have content to watch. You can't go down to uh, Best Buy, for example, and buy a 4K mastered Blu-ray. Blu-ray no. doesn't exist in 4K. You can't get 4K content unless you've got very specialized hardware. So right now it's kind of a pie-in-the-sky thing for, for consumers. Having said that, it's nice that Apple's got a machine that can keep up with all that. For the people who are doing content creation, and let's face it, that's always been the Mac Pro's strong suit, right? You know, you've seen Mac Pros in, in production studios uh, for film and video. Uh, you've seen them in, in, uh, in, in, in you know, audio uh, engineers, uh, uh, suites and stuff like that. Um, you, you see them used in science, and these are all the niche markets that Apple is hoping to reach with the new Mac Pro, at least based on the marketing material that we've seen from them so far. I just, is I know, still, like, you guys are, sorry, go ahead, Ellie. Is that still the case with 4K? You pretty much, there's, I don't know that much about it. I just know that it's not supported, but is that still the only way to get 4K content is through Sony? Well, Sony's the only box that I'm aware of that does it. Like they, they have the only like end-to-end -end solution that I'm that I'm aware of right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's just there's a minimum of 4K content right now and it's that's also available arguable, for home consumption. Like it, you have to sit, at, you have to be at least 2.5 times the distance. Like the size of your screen times 2.5 gives you the minimum distance that you have to be away from it before you even notice the difference. I mean, if you're sitting far enough away, 720p is indistinguishable from 1080p still. Um, so this is mostly right now a six to seven figure sports athlete problem and not a normal human problem. And it's, it's pretty but, much a spec war where I don't think people really know what they're buying. I, I mean, you look at TVs, people complain about, oh, 120 hertz refresh rate compared to whatever. Well, if your cable provider or whatever channel you're watching only broadcasts in 60 hertz, that's, that's what you're watching. So. Well, I just know at some point there's going to be a picture of Al M.F. Gore sitting at his desk with three <laughs> 4K displays powered by his brand new gold uh, <laughs> Mac Pro, and I'm going to be hella jealous. I'm just putting that out there. It's a nerd's problem. So switching gears slightly... Um, I was talking a lot this week about sensors, and uh, we've been discussing this too, and this is one of the areas that I think a lot of companies are doing really interesting stuff. And if we go back to the beginning, to Steve Jobs introducing the iPhone in 2007, he also spent time talking about how the accelerometer would let the iPhone's interface turn with the phone, and the proximity sensor would turn off that interface, but also uh, you know, dim the screen, stop touch events when you brought it to your ear. They had capacitive multi-touch, which would sense the bioelectric field in your fingers and let you use them as pointers instead of those little resistive styluses that were pressure based in the old days and they added gyroscopes for rotation around gravity uh, and they just kept 
kept increasing a GPS, um, Wi-Fi wi router location mapping, all these things to make the phone understand its sort of place in the world. And now we've got Siri, which turned the microphone into something intelligent. Um, Apple has just bought the company that Prime Sense, the company that made the sensor for the original Kinect. So EyeSight can already do these things like detect multiple faces and do HDR and do motion reduction and maybe it will be able to better map 3D environments at some point. Touch ID took our home button and instead of it just being a mechanical switch, now it can actually read our fingerprints. Um, and Ali, it seems to me that we are approaching a time um, you know, we've got eye beacons rolling out now where our phones aren't becoming intelligent like our nightmares like the Matrix or Terminator, but they're beginning to understand themselves, the network that they're connected to, and us as a user on a personal level. And that's going to sort of herald us into this next generation Internet of Things where our coffee makers and cars and everything are just, you know, tuned into where we are and what we want. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think you see it's it's more little steps. It's not that, you know, your devices are going to magically know everything, but I think they're getting better at interacting with the things around us and playing nicer with each other. They're friendly. <laughs> Well, no, but Siri, and to give an example, and I've used this before, uh, my little godson thinks Siri is a friend, so he picks it up and he starts talking to it, and he, if a text comes in, it'll read it to him, and he can reply with a text. He can't read or write, but Siri has enabled him to interact with that device. And Richard, if you look at something like Google Now, and they're bolder in this sense than Apple is, they pull stuff from your web history, from your calendar, from your mail, they'll alert you to your planes, they'll... It's, it's starting to not only wait for you to ask for stuff the way Siri does, but push stuff at you when they think is relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, Google Now is a really, a really, really good example because uh, some people still think it's pretty creepy, but it's, you know, once you opt in and you start using it, it's, it's a fantastic service because, like I say, if you're, if you're integrated into a Google stuff, so you've got your mail and calendar and everything, It'll tell you where your appointments are. You can, it, you know, you can tell it where you where you work just with minimal kind of uh, minimal kind of input, and it will start pushing these things to you. Like you need to leave for your meeting now. You, it's going to take you this long to get to work because traffic's this bad. Uh, you know, do you want us to uh, set a reminder for this? You, and there's, there's, they're kind of pushing it as well with the always listening stuff that uh, that's coming out through the Moto X, and obviously that's got a like a tailored hardware element to it as well but that's that's kind of for me that's the sort of area that I would like Siri to go into some some kind of fact that it's always on that I can just leave my phone sat at the desk and not have to touch it and just say Siri what's you know what what's the time what's the time where everybody else I work with lives or <laughs> set a reminder for this and you know we, we, we've seen it kind of bits and pieces from different uh, different providers but I think if we can kind of get everybody's stuff together, we we might be uh, we might be on something really special. It was funny. I was driving around with Phil Nickinson in uh, Silicon Valley last last week, and he dropped his Moto X at some point, and he just said, uh, "Okay, Google, now find my phone," and it started beeping at him. Now, you know, that solved the problem in like he could now find the phone, but he's strapped into a seatbelt and it's below the chair and his <laughs> arms are wa waving back and forth. He's trying to dig forward. He's spinning around in his chair. Well, I, and I, you do not want to be in a car with me. I am driving on the highway while Phil is taking his life into his hands by trying to dig for his phone. But, you know, with an if it wasn't always listening, you just, you wouldn't be able to do that at all. You would have to access the phone or use a secondary device. But what I like that's interesting about this, Peter, when you look at something like iBeacons um, or even like you know GPS turned on, and because your phone could use GPS to find out where you were, they could also pull information like you know what traffic congestion is like in your area. When you use iBeacons, these things can provide you with push notifications, yes, and tell you about products or guide you through a museum. But you also become an iBeacon, and it's almost like these little dots we used to have that were cell towers or Wi-Fi routers. Uh, are are lighting up all the in between now with individual devices that are part of like a hive minded network. Yeah, that's that's the whole idea. You know, the the idea that that, that there's this um, mesh network of devices that you can tap into to do different things. Uh, you know, taking it to its logical to extreme, it's it's easy to imagine a house filled with eye beacon. Um, adapted appliances that, uh, or you know, lighting switches and so on that turn on 
um, as as you uh, as you approach. You know, it'll be great with that stuff. And we've seen some practical applications for it, like with what Major League Baseball um, has has done with uh, uh, where the uh, the New York Mets play. Um, so you know, there's certainly um, there's certainly a lot of applications for the technology. It's just a question of the technology itself, sort of reaching a critical momentum uh, with uh, companies that want to adapt it and incorporate it into their stuff. And we'll see how widespread it gets. Um, you know, it, it remains to be seen how far this is going to reach beyond just the iPhone. And I think that it's really it, it has to uh, in order for iBeacons to succeed. It's interesting. I made up this little sort of uh, fantasy story in the piece I wrote about it, where uh, you know you wake up, and as you're waking up, it realizes you've woken up, so it starts right raising the temperature in your house. And then as you work, walk from room to room, it has your coffee ready. It alerts you that traffic is uh, is slowed down, so you have to leave earlier for your appointment. And then it emails everyone at the appointment after that, you know, trying to reschedule. Uh, because of the delay, it starts your car when it knows you have to leave and raises your garage and transfers your podcast from your phone to your car stereo even as it moves the map locations and brings that up on the car's display. Then as you're driving, an iBeacon at the building you're going to will lead you to the next available parking space and then to the office of the person you're meeting. Then you put your phone down on the table and the 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 piece of glass on that desk becomes your environment because iCloud knows all your preferences. It just becomes the workspace you need to use. And then when you're leaving, maybe it detects your, you know, the watch that you're wearing, detects that your blood sugar is low, and there's a vending machine there. And because it, you've identified yourself with Touch ID previously, it can negotiate a transaction for you. So an energy bar just pops out, uh, and then you, it directs you way back to your car. And these all these things. I mean, they call it the Internet of Things, but there's all of these things that if you let the technology help you, it's not truly intelligent. Like there's no agency or sentience behind it, but it has become helpful to you in so many ways. And that's the sort of thing I think they'll do it slowly because people are change adverse and afraid of you know too much automation. But I think that's the kind of stuff we're seeing now. And I'm convinced, Peter, that Apple people feel the same kind of pain and future longing we do. Like, you know, they want to control the temperature in their house more than a nest allows, and they want to, you know, find a parking space faster than the little LED display allows. Ah, you know, it, I, and I have to admit, as I'm going through it in my head, Renee, I, you're kind of creeping me out a little bit with, <laughs> with this stuff. I'm not I sure. I know that... your tea preference. It'll be ready for you when you get here, Peter. I'm not sure that I want my life that tightly regulated by what devices in my pocket and what devices are embedded in my house and my car and and everywhere else. It just, I don't know. It, it seems like uh, maybe I'm just being paranoid, you know. But it, it just seems weird to me. Get off my lawn and out of my pocket. <laughs> yes, exactly. Ali, what about you? Is that creepy or is that uh, future awesome? Uh, if I can dispense cookies, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I I don't think it creeps me out that much. Um, I think if where Peter's saying, if someone would have, if Renee would have said what he just said about Siri four years ago, you probably would have been creeped out about that. So he still I is. Know. <laughs> I don't really Google use Siri that much, to be honest. I use it a lot. Um, more as an assistant than, you know, just random things. But, I mean, I use it to create appointments and reminders and send text messages while I'm driving and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, I still think it's a little creepy that Google now listens all the time, but I understand its application. Um, and I could I think that'll be something that Oh, so we'll perfect question for you, Ali. So that Google now listens all the time, Xbox One watches all the time. Is that yeah, any different weird. than a... But is that different than a pet in your house? A pet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my pet can't talk and can't transmit data as far your as I know. Your pet's not talking to Google. Dexter's as not on the phone with Google. Know. As far as you know. Now, the little the one that, that's questionable. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't but know. That's the thing, Richard. I mean, every one of these are negotiations that you make between, like, what privacy and information are you or data are you willing to give up, and what services are going to be rendered to you for it. Yeah, it's the old, it's the old uh, people don't want to give Google their information argument. Just opt out of it. I mean, the, the, it's not, it's not necessarily obvious, but I mean, when you fire up Google now for the first time on an Android phone, it asks you, do you want? This is what we want to do for you. Do you want to do it? If you say yes, they'll start 
using all your data, emails. You know, the, we've we've posted something today because the uh, the latest version of Google Maps for iOS is it'll now pull information from your Gmail so that it'll show you your flight information if you search for an airport or you know you made reservations at a restaurant. You search in Google Maps for where this restaurant is. It'll pull your reservation information and it'll it'll you know it'll uh, populate all that for you. If you don't want it, you, you know, don't don't use it. But it's, I mean, well, TripIt I'm would quite... do that for a while, right? Like you could give TripIt your Gmail login, and it would yeah, just exactly. And, uh, I think I, I think I even put that in one of the comments when uh, someone someone questioned something about it. And yeah, you you can give TripIt your the the authority to look in your emails, and when it sees a, a reservation for travel, it'll it'll pull it all in. And some of these kind of services are really really good. I mean, when I was traveling about a lot uh, in my previous job, I I relied on Google Now heavily for reminding me that I needed to set off for this meeting, I needed to be here at this time, and it, it would, you know, tell me I need, you, you're you running out of time to hit the road, get going now. So for for the right kind of person, these sort of things are really, really, really useful. You just have to kind of get over that privacy concern thing and just, just, just go in, you know, just go in on it. So it's interesting to me, Ali, I remember a, a few weeks ago, maybe it was even, you know, more than a month ago now, you did an article about Touch ID and how if you try to replace the Touch ID sensor, it no longer works. You have to use the original part. And I asked about that, and the answer I got was yes, absolutely. When we create a service like Touch ID, uh, securing that data is the absolute most important thing to us, and we want to make sure that, you know, it only goes through a hardware channel. It only releases a yes-no token. And that's why apps can't use it now, for example, because you know how do you stop apps from spoofing a yes/no token? There's all these considerations, and I like that we have the choice. Like we can use Google services and give them all that information, or even mailbox, you know, give them our Gmail login, and they'll reduce our spam or something, or better organize us. But then on the other hand of the spectrum, you can use a company that's that doesn't really require that much data, or uh, provide solutions that you can. I'm going off track here a little bit, but but actually really sweats the details of making sure that nothing can get out if it if it doesn't want it to. Mm, yeah, I don't I don't I don't understand what the question is. <laughs> so I mean the thing is like Touch ID can be scary for people because you know like like the minute Touch ID came out we saw all these people go oh the NSA invented this to get all your fingerprint data mm. or people will be able to steal this and they went to incredible pains to make sure nobody can get this off of the machine. Mm -hmm. And for those of you, I mean, for people that didn't see the article, basically if something happens to Touch ID and you want to user replace it or do a DIY repair on it, no component that is involved in Touch ID can be replaced. So that means if your screen breaks, um, you know, you can't just buy a, a front that has a home button and Touch ID sensor cable connected, which some of the assemblies come that way, like on the iPad, because those cables are so thin and easy to tear. Um, if you do that, it will fail. So somehow it's tied to, it's it's a hardware tie. Yep. So I don't necessarily think it's scary. I think that we're kind of at a point with technology to where it has to progress, and I think that we want our devices to do more, and we want to have to do less to do that, but there has to be a give and take there. And we were uh, we did another article about you know because a lot of people have been complaining about Touch ID. I don't know if you've seen this, Peter, but I've seen this everywhere. You know, like for me, it works 90 to 95 percent of the time. When it doesn't work, it's because there's some liquid on my finger or on the Touch ID sensor, and I just wipe it off on my shirt or my or whatever, and press the button again, and it works fine. Very very once in a while, it doesn't work at all. Uh, I've only retrained it once, and that wasn't intentionally. It's because I reinstalled my phone. But other people say that it barely works or never works or has a high failure rate for them. Indeed, and my um, anecdotal experience is very similar to yours, Renee. I um, have had almost zero problems with it. I think I've had maybe the entire time I've been using it maybe three or four failures at most where it didn't recognize a, a fingerprint that I know that it had stored, and typically just reorienting my finger fixed the problem. Um, I, I can't explain why some people are having more problems with Touch ID than others um, outside of, you know, for whatever reason, their fingerprint data is not being interpreted correctly. There are edge cases, though. Oh, um, there is um, there is an explanation for that as far as I understand it. So what happens with Touch ID is you the, the metal ring detects the um, capacitance that a finger is there. It takes a high-resolution photo, converts that into math, sends it, 
to the touch ID sensor, stores that, and in the future when you use it, it compares the mathematical representation of your finger to the print that's stored. But it doesn't only do that. Every time it scans your finger, it tries to improve the quality of the mathematical representation stored on the chip. And what seems to be happening sometimes, and this is just a theory, but you know, based on you know, some understanding of the situation, it that gets that goes wrong. The the incremental, the sequential updates go off in the wrong way and start making it less reliable instead of more reliable. And unfortunately, Apple's not doing any sorts of corrections for that. So if it goes the wrong way, uh, it can go really bad, and you have to delete the finger and retrain it. In an ideal situation, it should be the same, if not better, over time. So I think that Peter might just be an an effect. So you think that's a software theory. issue? Yes. Okay, because I mean, I know my experience is similar to you and Peter's. I don't really have issues. I'm pretty sure the fingerprints that are in there are the same fingerprints I set up in the Apple Store when I bought my phone. Now, my girlfriend, on the other hand, she will do Touch ID. She'll she's re-registered hers probably eight or nine times. It'll work fine for a week or two, and then slowly it'll start try again, try again, try again, to the point to where it's not reading her prints. She'll delete all of them, redo it, works in the same thing over and over again. Have you put one of your fingerprints on her phone to see if yours degrade as well? Um, I don't know. I should. I have put them on there, and they don't fail, but, I mean, we've never, like, kept them on there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe we should and see over time if, you know, if mine starts degrading. Maybe her fingerprints are just funny. I don't know. Because there are some I've faulty units that never work. Uh, like there's, there are cases where they actually there's a problem, and you have to go have the phone exchanged. But my, my point is, I'm wondering if these people are edge cases or if this is happening. I, I'm not hearing really widespread criticisms or, or problems of Touch ID, which, which suggests to me that, that, that these problems are edge cases. And that's not to diminish uh, your girlfriend's issue, Allie. That's not to diminish anybody's problems with it if they're having problems. But it just doesn't seem like it's widespread enough that Apple would really take notice and deploy a major software update. Uh, to try to fix this. You know Surprisingly, I've seen several people that have 5S's, um, you know, people around here that have been getting them. They don't even set up fingerprints. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I. it seems like that step, Apple made it a little bit harder to get past that, and you just have to keep saying no. So you kind of have to put in the effort to just tell it, no, I don't want to set a passcode, I don't want fingerprints. But um, I've seen a lot of people that just don't use it. Of course, now that I've actually said something, I'm sure that I'm jinxing myself and I'm going to have major problems with my 5S from here on out. Your phone's going to blow up. So some people have also said that when their skin's especially dry, it doesn't work, but if they if they put like some hand lotion on and rehydrate their fingers, it works again. And there might be some people for whom the conditions when they stored it versus the conditions when they're using it are different enough to confuse um, the picture that it's taking. Most often for me, it's just like, you know, there's a, just a little bit of water. Um, you know, like Even now, like I, the other day it was melted snow. Like I, I was cleaning off my car, got in, tried to use Touch ID, and there was just a very small amount of melted snow on my finger, wiped that off, made sure the sensor was clean, um, and it worked too. Richard, I know yours asks for Touch ID, asks you to put in your code a lot, but is it actually Touch ID that, that doesn't work? No, no, I mean, the, 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 the Touch ID, yeah, it, the Touch ID sensor works fine. I mean, the, the, the only problems I ever have with it are if I don't line up my finger properly, which is easily done, or... Like when I'm eating pizza or something like that, and you know, and you get some greasy, greasy fingers. It's not really when you want to be touching your phone anyway. But aside from that, it works. It works flawlessly every time. My my biggest beef is that for some reason I continually get asked for it. Not only when downloading lots of new apps, I have to reauthorize Touch ID and do all this. But when I'm downloading an update, more or less every single one nowadays, I'm having to put my thumb on and. So it's working overdrive and it's working great. This you know, I, I have other issues going on that. I would say probably need a software update just for me. Thanks, you're shifty. It knows maybe. you're using Android phones and Windows maybe, phones. Maybe it's because I keep flicking between different app stores. It I, knows. I don't know. Yeah. So the only thing that I would recommend for people is if you are having trouble, uh, try re-registering re your finger and make sure that when it asks you, you know, you put your finger on it and you move it around enough in the first part that you're getting all the different parts of your thumb. And then in the second stage, you really do every edge because 
when you're using the phone and you're just training Touch ID, you have a habit of holding it perfectly in front of you. But when you pick it up, you might be at an angle. You might be using the tip of your thumb. You might be using the edge of it. And you want to make sure that you train all the parts that you're likely to use in real life. Some people have trained, have used more than one slot for the same finger and said that improves the accuracy tremendously. I don't know if there would ever be any problem with the learning algorithm or collisions or anything, so I can't recommend that, but you can try it and maybe it'll work for you. But also really just wipe off your hands, make sure the sensor is clean. Um, and we put up an article, I'll put it in the show notes, of, of things that you can try um, just to improve the quality. But I don't think there's any, and correct me if I'm wrong anyway, but I don't think there's any widespread problem with Touch ID at this, at this stage. No. Huh, well, I'm glad that's off, uh, off our... <laughs> um, Ali, you've been looking at keyboards for the mm -hmm. iPad Air, and I know that you know anytime a new design comes out, people, a lot of people liked using the full-size iPad with a keyboard as sort of a laptop replacement. And then when the iPad Air came out, it was a different enough form factor that a lot of the keyboards they had previously didn't work. So we've been getting a lot of requests for keyboards. What is the state of keyboards for the iPad Air now? Uh, a lot of them are available. I actually have some sitting right here. But um, there are a lot. And if you use a keyboard case with an older iPad, they're the same. They're just pretty much revised. So you've got some folio type ones. This one's by Logitech. Um, this is a gray keyboard folio. They're ultra thin series. Um, Logitech also makes a super thin one that's always been one of my favorites. I don't really like to add a lot of bulk and the air is one pound and you know you don't like to add to it so stuff like this keyboard covers that snap on um, just works just like a smart cover would. Um, my iPad's in the other room though. Um, you know one by Zag iPad just kinda clicks right in here and then you've got a full keyboard. Um, so a lot of it if you've had a keyboard cover before they're going to be mostly the same. I've never been a huge fan of iPad mini keyboard covers because the keys are, you can't even really see that because it's black. But um, iPad mini, they're really small. So I, I've never been able to comfortably type. So I was excited. You know, I went for the mini last time around. I went for the Air this time around. I missed being able to just type on my iPad. Um, Richard, I know he likes to thumb type on his iPad mini. Um, I do pretty well at that too, but you know, when I want to sit down and write, I want a keyboard, and uh, there's, there's a lot of really good options. So what do you think about using that versus using a MacBook Air? Because I know a lot of people want to use it as a laptop replacement. I think that heavily depends on what you do on your computer. Um, if you're a browser, if you need to type, um, you can even get away with some image editing depending on if you have a camera kit for your iPad and you know you just want to load them that way but anyone that needs to manipulate images in Photoshop or anything like that you're not going to be able to replace a laptop just yet um, I have a workflow where if I just want to go right and get things done I will just take my iPad and a keyboard case to Starbucks or a local coffee shop and hammer out a bunch of stuff and just leave the images, video, things like that out until I get home and then do all that. So I haven't been able to ditch it yet. Some people might if they're just casual browsers, emailers, want to read news feeds, things like that, interact with friends and family. I think, I think it's getting there. Peter, do you have a lot of retail people asking you about this iPad Air versus uh, MacBook Air? Um, not not as such, but we do have a lot of people who come in um, looking at the iPad Air or iPad Mini as a potential laptop replacement and are interested in, uh, in keyboards. Now, for the store that I work at, most of what we sell um, are folio cases specifically because that seems to be just in general what most people want. They want something with, with front and back protection, uh, something that's completely self-contained. Um, I, I have to agree with Allie. I think that the uh, the iPad mini cases that are out there, at least the ones that I've seen, uh, the fact that they are scaled for the mini means that they they are working with a smaller keyboard um, than than what you have with an iPad, which uh, a full sized iPad, which is not quite full sized, but it's pretty damn close. But you know the 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 actual user experience of using a keyboard on an iPad is still remains awkward because. Um, you know, even with um, a, a, a keyboard that's really designed for the iPad and even with the right options turned on, 
um, in in the iPad settings, you're still removing your fingers from the keyboard and going to the screen and pressing the screen um, to uh, you know pressing buttons on the screen. Uh, activating stuff on the screen, so it still kind of takes you out of that experience compared to using it on a uh, a MacBook Air, for example, where you've got a trackpad integrated into the same um, uh, horizontal the same. surface that you're typing on. You know, which makes it, I think, a much easier, much more intuitive experience. I think that all comes down to how and what you're using it for. Um, I use it to write, so I very rarely end up touching the screen or doing things outside of Byword or a couple apps where, um, I think, Renee, didn't you post a shortcut? Did we post a shortcut? Uh, we linked to uh, Federico, uh, sorry, Federico Vitici of uh, Mac Stories had a, was compiling a list of keyboard shortcuts, and we linked to it. Yeah, so I mean a lot of these keyboards too, and I'll, I'll cover that in reviews, um, they do have shortcut keys such as multitasking, home button, um, switching between international keyboards, Siri, dictation, um, things like that, locking it. Cut, so copy, a lot paste of a, like you would on a normal keyboard. Yeah, so you don't have to touch a screen for that. So um, it just depends on your use case, but I do think it's kind of awkward if you're jumping between apps that require you to touch the screen and then ones that you're typing in. The other keyboard thing that happened just today, and I almost skipped it, but I wanted to talk about it, especially with you, Richard, because you've got a cross-platform background and you've used Swipe and Swift Key, is that the first example of like, Apple does not allow you to replace the keyboard system-wide the way Android does, but starting today, you can. There is apps that are out that lets you within the app change the keyboard. Um, I'm going to mispronounce the name of this. I think it's Flisk. Do we know how to pronounce this name? Anybody? Is it Flisk? Flick? Flickle? Flex, 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 flex. flex. Oh, flex. I just is it Flexy or something? Like yes, flex. I, um, it's flexy. F L E K S Y. So I'm guessing Flexy. Flexy. Yeah. It has so a Y on it, so we'll have an E on it. <laughs> it has its own app, uh, but now it's got an SDK that lets you embed it into other apps, and four apps have done just that, um, and those are Launch Center Pro, um, Write Box, I'm sorry, Word Box, Blind Square, and Google Voice Connect, GV Connect. And it gives you different technology. For example, um, it lets you do a bunch of different gestures to enable things. I tried it out. The learning curve was a bit much for me, especially the way they, they had interrupters put onto it. So, you know, it's not something I'm that interested in, but I know a lot of people want alternative keyboards. Um, the difference is because you can't do it on a system-wide basis, you have to enable it individually within apps, and that means like only these four apps can do it. And for me, I want a consistent experience. I don't know how you feel in general about keyboard replacements. Richard, and how you think they're going to do on iOS? It, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. I mean, the, the difference with Android in particular is that it's a system-wide change. So you can download SwiftKey, you can download Swipe, uh, countless other ones. You just tell the OS that this is my keyboard now, this is what I want to use, and it'll pop up everywhere. Messages, email, any app that requires a keyboard, it will just appear. So you know, for all intents and purposes, you find one you like. So I, I love SwiftKey. That's what I have on all my Android devices. You install it, and every app you go to, you just get the Swift Key keyboard. So, the way iOS works, it's going to be a little bit jarring because you're going to have a with with Flexi, for example, you could really, really fall in love with it, but you can't use it for for much. You the, you can use it Especially in its own the app. Apple apps. And, <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can use it in its own app, and you can share to certain things, and you can use it. Let's say, you know, it's in, it's got its own SDK, and you can use it in certain other apps. But you're gonna if if you start really sort of falling in love with it, you're going to go back to a stock Apple app, and you're going to end up with the you know with the iPhone keyboard again. And, and you mentioned the learning curve as well. It's it, it's specific maybe to this this particular app, but it's there is a learning curve, and I'm not 100% convinced that the it, it's 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 an, it's a good idea, but I'm I'm just don't think we're there's there's much need for it right now because. Well, what do you unless, like about SwiftKey over the Android stand, the the stock so the, Android key? I mean, the SwiftKey thing. The, there's two things I like about it. Uh, the predictions are phenomenal. So you can sign into SwiftKey. Uh, you can sign it into your Twitter account, Gmail, Facebook, and it will learn how you write. It'll so if you have words you use a lot or regional spellings, things like that, it, it'll it'll pick up on what you you know, the, the words you use. So it'll it'll use that to help generate your predictions. So if you if if you do the same combination a lot, it will literally just appear on the screen word for word. It it'll just keep running so you can just tap 
it gets tap, you. Tap, tap. Yeah, it, and you know, it, it's it's once you've used it, it's it's really really good, and it's hard to kind of pull yourself away from. And the other thing is something that uh, a lot of keyboards have got. You see, uh, Google's got it on the stock keyboard and uh, Swipe. It, it came basically from Swipe is what people associate most with, and it's the joining up. Uh, you know, dragging your finger across the across the screen. For me, it seems to work better on Swift Key than any other uh, kind of swipey type keyboard. And that's, I, I mean, for me, I think that's the that that would be. I would be more attracted to something like this this Flexi app if you could do that. It's uh, the the gestures are nice, but it's still just a keyboard. You're still just typing away, typing away. And yeah, you can flick to delete and flick to. But I don't sometimes want to delete the whole word. I just want to delete a letter. So it, it's it's kind of. It's a good attempt, but it's not quite there. And I think if it was, I, I'd be more, um, I'd be more about giving it a, a whirl, but potentially on the iPad, especially if we had some kind of swipe esque kind of joined up thing about it, because I think that's that's something that I would like Apple to to, to eventually bring into their keyboards, because once you once you get used to it and you're using it a lot, you go back to something where you've got to tap out every single letter, and I'm fast enough on the iPhone, but it's just not the same as just running my finger across the screen with SwiftKey and, and having it all do it for you. Yeah, they advertise that their prediction is much better and that they offer, I think, 117% of the typing space and that you could basically use it without looking at it and it'll still auto-correct you. Is there, is there any appeal to you in third-party keyboards, Ali? Sometimes, yeah, I think so. I still like to kind of tinker, so I've kind of been itching for a jailbreak to come out just so I can play around again. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and there you had um, quite a few keyboards that you could use. There were things like Swipe that you could install through jailbreak, um, and those are cool. Um, I don't think a lot of developers have put in a ton of time and effort until now with that. This is the first one I've really seen because it is so app dependent, because Apple's never going to allow, you know, Richard can change a keyboard and it changes everywhere. That's not the case. Yeah. And Peter, the thing for me that's interesting too about this is, for example, the iPhone keyboard was written more or less by one guy, Ken Kashinda did the iPhone keyboard. And, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into that, but there's these whole companies now who all they do is make keyboards. SwiftKey made a keyboard, they licensed it to a bunch of Android vendors, they licensed it to BlackBerry for the BB10 keyboard, and there's tons of people in development going on behind that. As much as I think these keyboards may not work on iOS, I do like the idea that maybe Apple will have pressure to evolve the iPhone keyboard faster. Absolutely. Competition always helps, even if it's not directly on the platform. Uh, we saw some changes to the way the keyboards work in iOS 7, and I'm sure we'll continue to see an evolution. But, uh, you know, without the uh, keyboard being able to sw be swapped out um, in the same manner in which it's, it's done on Android, um, I, I'm not really sure that Apple is going to get pushed in one direction that hard. Um, uh, uh, in any reasonable amount of time. So sort of the last, because we're getting, we're drawing to the end of our hour, but sort of the last thing I wanted to talk to you guys about was um, sort of this renaissance in messaging apps. And this is something that, I, it's hard to get your mind around how popular, like we all use iMessage on iOS, or at least a lot of people use iMessage on iOS. Google has Hangouts, Microsoft owns Skype, BlackBerry has BBM, but there's things like Line, which is huge in Asia. There's Facebook messaging. Twitter, which tried to bury direct messages for a while. You know, they thought that it would not appeal to the mainstream, has now brought them back front and center and has added the ability to DM images. And, you know, the day after that, Instagram has announced Instagram Direct, which is a way to, instead of just posting an image to everybody, you can personally send a message to just one or, you know, one person or a group of specific people. Um, Ali, do you think this is a response to the popularity of services like Snapchat, which you know has a reputation for being a racy app, but a lot of people just use for you know direct communications and just the growth of messaging in general? Sure. I think as more people have smartphones and more people don't want... Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't really get it. I would think that some of these apps would have been popular several years ago. I just... I feel like carriers have now started to make texting free, so unless it's you're looking at international, you know what I mean? It, I think they would have made more sense a couple years ago. I mean, I can kind of see the appeal now, but it's all over Wi-Fi anyway. There's things that are built in, like iMessage, but it's only iPhone to iPhone. 
Well, Ben Thompson, who did a great post online, said that the popularity was partially based on the use of images. Like, instead of typing out how you felt, you could just put a giant troll form there, Peter, with a scowl on its face, and that would tell your wife, you know, what or your husband, what was, you know, what they're in for when you got home in terms of your mood or attitude, or, you know, like, you know, what. Can you can you pick up this for me and you get a picture in response or whatever and it became a much it became I don't know what the right term is a trendier way to communicate but there's just so many of them doing it now. Yep, you know, it, 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 the, the, and it seems like there's new there there are new ones popping up every day every day. I can't keep up with them. Richard, is this just because BlackBerry didn't go cross-platform sooner? Could they have wrapped this up? Well, WhatsApp didn't wrap this up. I mean, is this just a space that's going to continue to explode? Everybody seems to want a piece of the the, the messaging pie, and you're right. Maybe if if BBM had gone uh, had gone cross-platform two three years earlier, maybe we would just have BBM and everything else would be just this little tiny. But I mean, it, it, part of the part of this, it, I remember when uh, we we posted about the WhatsApp iOS 7 update, and personally, I just don't get it. Still, I don't know anybody that uses it. I just use text messages and iMessage. I don't know if I'm old-fashioned, but I just don't know anybody that that would. Yeah, but are we people. are we like not young enough? Is this stuff that kids are using I, that we're totally it, oblivious it to? I mean, <laughs> I think I, it must have come about because I mean, I'm, I'm I don't even know where it would have come about because. Uh, you can understand on BBM on uh, on BlackBerry, it, it was free, uh, especially over here. It it was just part of the package, so you could you could message your friends for free without using the cost of either a text message bundle or paying for a text message. I, I get that, but here now I don't know what it's like in the states, but mo most, if not every contract, comes with unlimited text messages now, mm -hmm. or just you know like a Virtually ridiculous number yeah. like three thousand, five thousand. And with data becoming more and more readily available, I just, I, I just don't get why, it, why the appeal is. You know, WhatsApp needs a phone number. If someone's got a phone number, I'm just going to send them a message. If it, if they've got an iPhone, it'll become an iMessage. If they haven't, it, it'll just be a message. It doesn't cost me anything. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm old-fashioned, but. And, well, uh, I, I think actually, Richard, you, you've hit the nail on the head with what you just said, and that is that that it's it's a ubiquitous form of. No, and this is the thing, and this is why everybody wants a piece of it because, and it is slightly generational. I mean, I still, you know, I'm in my mid 40s. I depend on email a lot to stay in touch with people. I know that a lot of younger people, especially millennials, don't use email. You know, they just text the, everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, it makes sense to me that that there are companies out there, social networking companies. Um, uh, and and other startups that are interested in grabbing a piece of this messaging pie because this represents uh, you know a huge form of communication for a very big and growing population of people. So from that perspective, it makes sense. But you know the balkanization of 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 messaging isn't helping anybody. There have got to be uniform standards, and the closest thing that we've got to that right now is is uh, is SMS. Still, um, ironically. Yeah, ironically, exactly. But you know, that's that's the that's the lowest common denominator. And the brilliant thing that Apple's done with iMessage is that it has overlaid iMessage on top of SMS, understanding that if you're doing point-to-point -point communication with somebody who's using OS 10 or uh, iOS, you are using iMessage and everything that iMessage brings to the table. If you're not, then it's just a plain old text message, and you know visually, instantly looking at it. Um, although, uh, you know, some, some muggles aren't aware of this, but if if you are familiar enough with iMessage, you know if the message is in blue, it's iMessage. If it's in green, then it's a text message. Uh, you know, and that sort of separates the uh, unwashed masses from the beautiful people, I guess, in the <laughs> iMessage universe. But, you know, by overlaying, my point in all this is by overlaying iMessage on top of SMS, Apple has abstracted it in a way where Apple is getting a big piece of that pie, uh, but it's it's transparent technology that works with everything, even for people who aren't. That's the big mistake that I think a lot of these other services make is that uh, it's it's an either or proposition. I can either use BBM or I can use uh, you know some various other tech service or this or that. Uh, but I just want one thing that works, and that's why I use iMessage because it just works. And I think that's why we're seeing stuff like uh, Google Hangouts trying to integrate with SMS because it is that single point of entry. 
Um, yeah, I want to look more into this. Uh, Daniel Rubino from our Windows Phone site sent us this diagram showing just how many of these services were and how differently they're spread out geographically. I mean, it goes back to Orkut being the most popular social network in Brazil, you know, that nobody else has ever heard of. Uh, <laughs> Just I'm different. with Richard. I just I don't know anyone that uses them. I'll give WhatsApp the fact that they do scan your address book and find other users. Um, and I did have a, some Creepy. people, but they're not people I ever talk to. Yeah. So and the fact that it needs a phone number to even activate it, why bother? Why not just use the phone? I get that in some countries, text messages and whatever might still be kind of uh, expensive, and 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 these things might be a cheaper alternative. But I mean, like. Like Peter was saying, iMessage works on the Mac as well, works on the iPad. So if you're in that system, it, it just it's everywhere. That's what Things I want. I want aren't. something that works on my phone, on my tablet, on my computer, yep. and like you know, that sort of thing. I just need. My brother recently migrated from a an iPhone to a Galaxy Note 3, and he's like, "Why don't you ever text me back?" I'm like, "Cause I'm on my computer and I don't feel like picking up my phone. And you don't have iMessage <laughs> anymore, so I ignore it." <laughs> You still call him a brother? <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. The blood's thicker than computing. <laughs> All now. right. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our Great Return episode. Um, Peter, what are, you, what are you working on lately, and where can people find you? Uh, the Well, I've got something in the, the works for people uh, who are interested in the new Mac Pro. I'm just waiting for uh, the final information to appear from, from Apple um, and uh, all sorts of other good stuff. I've been putting a lot of effort into Mac buyer's guides lately, so if you are thinking about buying a new Mac, uh, please come to the site and click on the buyer's guide link at the top of the page. You'll find lots of great details there about just about every Mac model that's available right now. Um, you can find me on iMore, of course, iMore.com, and you can also find me on uh, the uh, the Tweety Face at uh, Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H. And, Allie, what about you? What are you working on? Where can we find you? Um, right now I am buried in iPad Air keyboards. Um, <laughs> other than that, lots of how-tos. Um, Great Disney gamer. Uh, Mickey, what was it, Mickey's Castle Gamer's Guide? Game guides, yeah. So I've been Castle. doing a lot of game guides and how-tos. Um, and right now, keyboards. Uh, I am on all the things social for the most part at iMuggle, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Google+, uh, just under Ali Kazmuha, and, of course, at iMore.com. Richard, what about you? Uh, well, I'm starting to put together some uh, kind of holiday-related app guides for my fellow British people because we do exist and we do like to use our iPhones and iPads for for such things. Uh, I've also kind of jumped on deciding to review the new Angry Birds game and taking a look at the new Grand Theft Auto game, so my weekend's pretty much filled with games. Uh, but you can find me on the Twitters uh, at Ricker666 on iMore every single day and uh, on Google+, Plus, where you just have to search for my name. Nice, and I just changed the background on my screen because I wanted to point out that we are going to be... Oh, please go away, dialogue box. There we go. We are <laughs> going to be doing CES Live this year. Uh, that's the week of January 6th, I believe. We will be there broadcasting live all day, every day, from Tuesday to Friday from the South Hall, the CES show floor. We're doing it in partnership with Callie Lewis and John P. of Geek Beat. Uh, .tv. I'm going to be there. Richard is going to be there, but working for Android Central because it is a way bigger show for Android than it is for iOS. For iOS, it's basically the matrix of iPhone cases come flying by you on both <laughs> sides. But for Android, it's usually they have 20 devices already announced by the time the plane lands. Pretty um, much. Pretty much. But uh, you know, we're going to be there. I'll. We'll be taking turns hosting, so it might be me and Callie Lewis or Phil Nickinson from Android Central and John P. or Daniel Rubino and Kevin Michaluk. Uh, but the coverage will be on all the sites. You will not be able to miss it. So if you want to, if you if you want to be at CES, but you cannot be at CES, we are going to bring you there with us. So just look for the hashtag CES, CES Live on all the social networks. You'll be able to see it on all of our sites, and that will be at the beginning of January. Before then, we have our traditional I'm more awards, the Reader's Choice Awards. You can still nominate. Just go to the site, imore.com. You'll see a big banner there. You can nominate your favorite apps and applications, sorry, your favorite apps, accessories, and devices, and the voting will start soon. We'll have the editor's version of that as well, and we'll also have our traditional what we use, what we recommend stuff. So if you're looking for last minute gifts or ideas, you'll have a plenty of them um, to look for. Am I forgetting anything? Anything else I should be pimping? 
All the stuff. Just look at all the stuff. We have. All the uh, you can go to. There's a brand new page up for best apps. Ali has been whittling her fingers down to small tablet size, making all these fantastic best apps posts. Simon Sage has been doing best games. So if you go to imore.com/best-apps, uh, you'll find those. They're also in the menu bar. Check that out. Who? Best, I'm best, take a best. Now. Best, best, best. Gold is best. Uh, you can find me at Renee Ritchie. You can find all of us at iMore. I want to thank the chat room for being here. You guys are a handsome and lovely bunch. We appreciate you turning out each and every week. If you don't watch the show live, please do. If you miss it, you can catch the video or the audio on iTunes, on RSS, on YouTube, and in all the places. Guys, have a fantastic day. Thank you so much. 